very much. Thank you for inviting us. So it feels like we, we kind of really crashed the party because we don't know a lot of you and we don't actually know Jackals at all. We don't study Jackal at all. Uh, but thank you for the very welcome party because we're, we're really enjoying and learning a lot. So before we present the project that we thought might be of most of interest to you guys, I thought I would just tell you who we are since we don't really kind of know you. Um, and technically, Martina and I have been working together for 15 years now, I think. Um, and our interest is really um, dog behavior and cognition to start off with. Uh, but then we sort of got more and more interested in what changed during domestication from wolves to dogs. So we come from the behavior and cognition perspective, and, this, and we're very much theoretical researchers so we're interested in the process of domestication. What happened, especially in terms of what changed in behavior uh, from wolves to dogs. And uh, we started basically working in Austria at the World Science Center. This is a very particular place. Um, it was set up by three uh, researchers, Bilgerane, Kurkutaschel, and um, Shukidirani. And we joined uh, a few late years later. And we raised wolves and dogs exactly in the same way in captivity. And this allows us to test them on behavioral tests and cognitive tests. So for example, here you see two wolves cooperating on what is called a string pulling task. And this is basically a table that has food in it, and there is a rope that goes through it. If you just pull one side of the rope, the rope comes out. If you pull both sides at the same time, the, pool, uh, the table moves forward and you can both get food. So these are the kind of cognitive tests that we have been conducting with the wolves uh, and the dogs. However, because um, we are a big group and kind of very sort of active group, we started thinking, okay, this is not enough, right? Because we have wolves and the dogs in captivity living in the same way. But, uh, and this allows us in a sense to kill uh, or uh, diminish as much as possible the effect of experience, uh, leaving really just the species of the variable of interest. But of course, we're also interested in knowing how experience may shape behavior and cognition. So we also study um, pet dogs uh, in a lab in Vienna, but also actually in Italy, that's where we both started working. Uh, and then Martina came and did her PhD with us, uh, and she got interested in studying free-ranging dogs. Uh, because again, free-ranging dogs are a population which is actually the most representative of the world's dog population. 80% of dogs live in a free-ranging way. For us Europeans, um, we have dogs in our head as pet dogs. Uh, often we have dogs in our head as breed dogs, but even the concept of breed is very recent. It's only Victorian times that really the concept of breed as we know it today uh, emerged. So actually we were interested in saying, okay, for domestication, if we go and study free ranging dogs, those dogs that have been living alongside humans, but without being completely controlled by humans, more like pigeons or rats that live together with us, but we don't, you know, control them in any kind of way, or, or we do culling them, but you know what I mean, they, they live alongside them. Maybe we can actually, this will reflect more the kind of social organization that original dogs had, those sort of dogs that started living and moving away from wolves. So we started working uh, with free-ranging dogs in 2016, and this work is ongoing. So we now have um, three big projects continuing in Morocco on different aspects of free-ranging dog life. Um, and a gazillion students, that, yeah, too many students <laughs> working there. And then the next step was that the domestication process, um, we realized, actually mirrors another kind of process that we can see in wild animals, which especially now in this anthropogene world, which is urbanization. So there are changes in um, uh, the populations that live closer to humans um, compared to more rural populations, for example, a diminishing fear of humans, a diminishing fear of what is novel, um, an increased exploration behavior, an increased sociality. Now, all of these processes actually are what we think also happened during domestication. So suddenly we thought, hmm, maybe urbanization is also a really interesting concept to try and study. And this is uh, how we ended up actually uh, connected, with, connecting with uh, Marco Polonio from the University of Sassari in Italy, uh, who studies wolves uh, in Italy. And we, because the population of wolves has exploded, and this is what I will go into a little bit now, we started uh, working also in Italy on wild wolves. 
Uh, so today I will focus on this kind of third project, but I just thought if we give you a, an idea of what we do, then if you're interested in asking other bits, you can just come and talk to us. Okay, so um, in, uh, this, this project was funded actually by the Vienna Science and Technology uh, Fund, uh, and it's a collaboration, as I said, with Marco Polonia, as well as with Felipe uh, Rangier from uh, the Med Uni. Um, I'm not actually going to be able to give you any results because the project is still ongoing and we have one more year of data collection in the field before we can actually do the analysis. But what we will do is just give you an idea of what we're doing, um, which hopefully is of interest to you. So, I mean, as you all know, we are uh, living in an increasing urbanized uh, environment. Now, in most cases, this creates quite a lot of problems for a lot of species because we're cutting away uh, in their home uh, habitats. But for some species, this can actually be an opportunity and not just a problem. Um, and uh, we see this uh, as a sort of, I mean, a lot of studies have been carried out now on this theme of urbanization. Uh, and we actually see it at the morphological level and at the behavioral level. So in this really interesting review, it's shown that populations living close, closer to urban areas uh, are actually physically larger, morphologically in mammals, larger than uh, the same sort of uh, species of a population living in more rural areas. So it seems that for some species, urbanization is actually something which may um, give them some benefits in terms of increased resources. Uh, and as I mentioned, from the point of view of behavior, uh, there is a decrease in fear towards humans, so a, um, a, a slower flight response when a human approaches is a classic test that is done. Um, there is an increase in exploration of human artifacts and less fear of uh, human artifacts and an increased sociality, conspecific sociality, because the more resources there are, uh, the more tolerance emerges between individuals yeah, of the same species. So these are some of the phenomena that uh, have, um, have been observed. This has led some authors uh, to think of this as an urban wildlife syndrome, so something that is kind of occurring in multiple species, a little bit like the domestication syndrome, uh, which is another of these ideas. Um, and, it, and this would sort of, at the behavioral level, would show these kind of things, an increase in explorative behavior, an increase in social tolerance, a decrease of uh, fear towards humans, and an increase in boldness. However, a really interesting review that was carried out on, I think it was 47 mammal um, species, showed that although the urbanization idea does hold, so in most of these uh, papers, you do find differences between populations in an urban compared to a rural environment, the direction of the change is not consistent. And it's not consistent across species, but often it's also not consistent within species. So it can be very localized to the different type of environments in which they are found, which is really interesting. Okay, so most of those studies have been carried out on small mammals. Um, however, as uh, there are quite some nice examples now, there are also large predators that can adapt to uh, urban living or can exploit urban environments. And these are two um, nice uh, examples. And canids, as I think you, uh, you guys, I mean, I don't know how to tell you, right? They're the most flexible of all. Uh, and two of the most uh, well-known sort of urban species of coyotes uh, and foxes. So the question for us was, well, could it be possible that one day I'll walk out in the middle of Milan and see a wolf? I mean, is, is this, you know, completely off the top of our heads? Or, or could, could there be something there? Um, I mean, as you guys all know, the wolves have been a complete conservation success story uh, in Europe. And in Italy, um, the population has gone from between 100 and 400 in the 70s, still unclear you know, how many these were, to the latest estimate was 3,300, although quite a lot of people think this is kind of over, uh, under, sorry, estimation, so that there are actually quite a lot more uh, wolves in Italy. Um, and this is a study that was col uh, conducted by Marco Polonio and um, his uh, PhD student um, and quite recent, came out quite recently and it's just for Tuscany. So this is our study area uh, and this is where he, uh, they have been working since um, basically the, the 1990s. And what you see is that the cells, again this is more your stuff than my stuff, um, and what you see is the dark areas are the urbanized, more urbanized area. And effectively, the pop and, and it's, um, these are 
where they have they found actually a, a random site, so so where there was a, a stable pack, yeah. And you can see that effectively they started off uh, from the more the less urbanized area, but they came closer and closer and closer. And really, only the valley uh, where Florence is is still empty of walls, but everywhere else is pretty. Cool. So in this kind of scenario, um, in uh, Italy where there is a very high population density, okay, not quite as India, but we have 206 uh, people per square uh, kilometer. Uh, what is happening is that these kind of videos um, are being taken more and more often. So these are opportunistic videos, they are taken uh, either from Facebook or from groups that we are part of that sort of circulate these. Um, but, but you can see this more and more often. Um, the second one, for example, is actually someone walking on foot with a dog on the leash. You can see the little dog just appearing there. Um, it was in the evening, but it wasn't sort of dead at night. Um, this and a few others are in broad daylight, so, so you do see this kind of phenomenon. Um, why is this happening? Food. I mean, it's always about food, right? <laughs> Where there's food, there's, there's, there's people and, food and you know, animals will follow. So just to give you a couple of examples, the first one is um, uh, orchards, the fruit that is not that can't be sold is left on the ground. This attracts ungulates, uh, for example, or, or wild boar, and behind the wild boar, wolf swallow, or you know, behind the ungulates, the wolf swallow. So this is kind of quite easy. The, this uh, other example is the centers of cows, milking cows. These are just thrown up on the rubbish dump uh, just outside the, the cow sheds. Um, this is rich food, and we're talking the centers, right? Wow, it's a fantastic snack. The last one, um, when there is a hunting of wild boar, the meat is butchered <coughs> and the leftover meat is put in new graves, I don't know how to call them, in, in, basically in holes. And these holes actually remain open for a few weeks uh, until they have added more and more, and then they just close it with a bit of, um, uh, of earth. And of course the wolves just learn where this stuff is and it's, it's great food. So of course, you know, um, there, there are very many reasons why. <coughs> Um, and potentially other reasons, uh, or maybe other opportunities. So here you actually saw a wolf predating uh, what we think was a free-ranging dog. Um, and this is happening a lot, in a, well, a lot. It seems to be increasing. So we know that wolves predate on, on dogs, this is nothing new. There's quite a lot of studies conducted. So one of our colleagues, uh, Elena Bassi, conducted a study in Croatia <coughs> where she saw that uh, wild boar hunting dogs um, the killing of wild boar hunting dogs by wolves has increased from 29 to 2018, I think was the time span. So I think this is, is something that is kind of well known. Um, but it creates a lot of emotions, um, human emotions. Because it's one thing if you're killing sheep, I don't name all my sheep, but normally I do name my dogs if you're my pet dogs and my hunting dogs. Um, they are prized. So the relationship with dogs is complex uh, in Italy. We have a lot of free roaming dogs, meaning they can be owned dogs or stray dogs that are not owned by anyone. But we have a lot of these kind of dogs. And so the relationship between the dogs and the wolves is something that is kind of complex, which has and does um, end up with hybridization events, uh, like uh, this pack that you see here which is a border collie pack, maybe, I don't know, it's a wolf and dog, but some of them looks like border collies. Um, and uh, the, the latest, at the national level, the latest studies uh, showed that there were uh, about 9% recent hybrids, meaning um, F1s, uh, uh, or back cross, or uh, first generation back crosses, so B1s, um, and about 12% of more distant, although it wasn't very clear from the report. This is not a published study, it's a report, and it's a national report. Um, okay, so in this context, uh, these are the kind of research questions that we developed and we're going to try and answer with our project. Uh, first of all, uh, we kind of wanted to figure out if we sort of uh, living in a more urbanized area uh, depend more on anthropogenic food sources. And this is in collaboration with Maldor Jaffa Piot and, and uh, Christian Popp from, from um, uh, the Berlin Institute uh, using isotope analysis, so from here. Um, so this is the first thing that we would like to answer. The second is whether, of course, living in a more urbanized environment have a higher hybridization index. 
this is in collaboration, in collaboration with Massimo Stambura from Sassari University. Um, the third one is also looking at cortisol and potentially testosterone levels. We're not quite sure about the testosterone yet. Uh, we have validated now the, um, the cortisol again from here because it gives us a more longer term measure of the cortisol. We might actually try um, males as well. Uh, this is based on purposes of like 20 minutes. Um, and then in collaboration with uh, Klaus Lang from the University of Vienna, we have developed a questionnaire that actually asks questions about free-ranging dogs and wolves, so both. Um, and hopefully we will roll this out soon. We haven't quite gotten there yet. And finally, what Martina will tell you a little about today, uh, and I'll give her the word in, in just a minute, uh, is that we also tried to um, look at the behavior of uh, the wolves living in more in closer proximity to humans uh, and further away by developing a series of tests that we met in front of camera traps. The first three questions, we were super incredibly lucky, uh, as pretty much what we had just won the project, to actually get in contact uh, with Carmela Musto. And some of you know her because of the cost action um, that her and Jacob Cerri uh, have just uh, submitted. And Carmela, uh, for her PhD, was working with uh, wolves, uh, interested in viruses. She's a, vet, uh, a veterinary um, student, was not a veterinarian, researcher. Um, and she had created a network in Italy to detect wolf carcasses. Uh, and so we started a collaboration together within, the project, within this project. Uh, and to date, we have 240 wolf carcasses that we can use for the analysis. Uh, for the diet and for um, the cortisol. Uh, and, and of course we know exactly where they were found, where the bodies were found. Not ideal because of course we know that wolves disperse, um, but what we can kind of do is do analysis um, on the adults only that have already been, uh, have already been reduced, and this at least for the females, she can tell when she finds the body, which is more likely to be wolves that were living where we found them dead. Yeah? Uh, so this is another component uh, of the project. Um, these questions, instead, we are also trying to uh, answer in the field. Uh, and here we totally and utterly and completely uh, depend on the collaboration with our Italian uh, partners, so Massimo Sanura, but also But yeah, so basically um, the knowledge of where the wolf packs are was already there when we started this project. Um, and uh, there was a lot of sort of uh, potential to sort of understand uh, the kind, even choose the kind of packs we wanted to, um, to test because there are so many. Um, so, so basically all the logistics of it was already in place when we arrived to start working. <coughs> And Martina will tell you a bit more of the details. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have published a field study in Kaskari in 2021. And um, every year we move in a different province uh, to test different parts of groups. And we see the three years that we did already there. And uh, the idea is to test at least for three, four to five parts by the end of the project. And uh, so we are not really testing, I mean, we call it urban goals, but we are not really testing goals inside towns because I mean, we didn't find them. But we test the goals in, always in wood, uh, in, uh, in the forest. But what we do is that uh, in each testing site, we calculate a, a sort of humanization gradient, an anthropization gradient, which differs a lot between the different uh, testing sites of the different wolves. And uh, we calculate this gradient in this area of 41 square kilometers surrounding the testing site, because we don't really know the exact territory of this wolf, which is a big limitation, but <laughs> what we can do. And, uh, and uh, the organization gradient, for now, we are thinking to calculate it using the night light index, which gives a measure of uh, the human disturbance of the area. And uh, in this area, we also collect the stats of the world to, to calculate an, an index of activization of the area. 
uh, which we include, we will include this uh, in the models as a compromise. So, so we do some behavior testing as far as that uh, to investigate uh, where urban walls, so walls that live in more um, disturbed areas, uh, are less new public and more risk from the walls that live in more quiet areas. And what we do is to uh, uh, look for places where to put our camera up, and uh, usually we do the test on the top, and you can see that we put two camera up and then our object uh, on, the, on the top. And um, these are the four tests that we do, and I will show you some videos. So the first test, so we start uh, testing in January, and we continue with the different tests until the end of August. And the first step that we do is uh, this um, presenting them a novel object, uh, which is to investigate uh, the neophobic reaction of the end. Neophobia, neophobia is the fear of poverty. And this is a very common test used in captivity, but also in the wild with many cities. So we do an initial baseline, so to be great then to the camera class, and then we put this object, which is uh, made of different plastic toys, and we touch them with the with ants, so they smell of, uh, they smell of the human, and we present uh, two different objects. And the idea is, so our prediction would be that uh, urban walls should be less fearful when they see this object for the first time than the rural wolves, and they will habituate faster to this object, and they will also generalize it more easily between the first and the second object. And so, what we are seeing is that they are behaving in different sides, they behave very differently, so some wolves, they don't care at all about the presence of the object, I think, okay. and others are quite afraid, uh, so if you can see the object there. <laughs> and other of the uh, other um, books are also interacting with the object, so they are So they 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 throw the object and they bite it and uh, so this was not back in our course of the last few years. It wasn't very open. <laughs> So the second test that we do is uh, a bean test. So we uh, show them a bean, uh, an empty bean for uh, one month to be present to the presence of each object. And then we put the uh, human leftover food in it and to see if they are, the urban wolves are more attracted to the food and bolder in general to approach the bean. And uh, in this case, um, so no wolves are really they're trying to get the food out from it, but some of them, in some areas, they approach it and we see interested to the, to the presence of the food. And here, actually, we did some preliminary analysis and we see that in more disturbed areas, they tend to approach more uh, about it. So this is another test that we do, which is my favorite, and we it is uh, done with stickers, uh, always to investigate if they are bolder when uh, if urban wolves are bolder when hearing human voices. <coughs> and this is in collaboration with Melody Palmer and the Flick Clubs in Japan. They develop these uh, boom boxes, which is a circuit board that you we solder to the camera class. And uh, basically when the camera class when the field sensor of the camera class detects a movement, uh, it sends a signal to the speaker, to the movement and the speaker, and then this sounds uh, fast. And we have um, a control condition, of course, with the bird, which does it as if they are afraid just of the noise. And then the test condition, which is, which is presenting human voices. And uh, here I show the, the control condition with the bird.
that has to do with the effect of uh, uh, that, uh, which seems clear, but it's common to use uh, these uh, dummy animals in this in, uh, in gas behavior that because at the beginning, at the very beginning, the animals think that I mean it seems that they think that it's really an animal, <laughs> and it's used often with uh, pet dogs in shelter. I mean shelter dogs to test if they are aggressive to other dogs and actually. It seems that there is a correlation between the reaction to the fake dog and their behavior to their real dogs. Also, so in this case, we can expect that urban wolves are more confident or aggressive towards the pet dogs uh, than the rural wolves. And also in this case, we have, of course, a control condition, which is a fake magpie. Towards this magpie, the wolves should not be aggressive or interested too much because they don't usually prey on magpies. Uh, but they should sometimes they prey on pet dogs. So, so this is an example with uh, the magpie. Um, so and usually they ignore it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't do much. Mm -hmm. But in case of the dog, they we we are. I've uh, seen many uh, social Thank you. 